Should I should I give away the zinger of the book? Is it a, should I should I put in a spoiler about the book? It doesn't occur until I guess I will. Here you are, folks. I don't think this will stop you from reading the book. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> but now I'm gonna I'm gonna risk it. There's so many good things. There's here. there's a lot of good yeah. things. But I will tell you the spoiler because it relates to what I was just talking about. <laughs> to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy, and hello, listeners. Our topic for today is... It's still not about communication. Whoa, it's still not about communication. Uh, we'll talk more about why we're saying that, and uh, we have a bunch of exciting developments that we're going to be talking about today. That's really what this podcast is about. Uh, but before we do that, let us invite you to do all the things folks do to let people know about our podcast. Tell your friends and what rate us, subscribe, rate us, like us, share us, all of follow that us. All, all of them are things. Mm -hmm. And something coming soon, it's not quite ready yet, uh, but sometime in the next few weeks, there will be a new website uh, instead of our not very nice website. You know, folks, if you want to check out our not very nice website, <laughs> you can do that now. It's ctn7.com. Uh, it's state of the art, what, 2005? Um, no, not, not even. quite 2005. Not that Maybe bad. 2010. <laughs> Maybe 2010. And it's it's uh, designed by uh, me. Uh, <laughs> And, and and you can immediately see, I'm not a professional web designer. Well, guess what? We have hired a professional web designer mm -hmm. who's doing a wonderful, wonderful job. She is wonderful, and we, and it's going to be very nice. It isn't ready yet, folks. But, you know, you can check that out. Check out the old so you can compare it to the new. Really appreciate the new. And the reason I thought of that in that moment is one of the things you will have on the new website is a very simple way of subscribing on multiple platforms or whichever, you know, your, your platform of choice to our podcast. So there'll be a button there, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that'll we're talking make about it that. easier. That'll make it a lot easier. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, and also, we want to put in a plug for the book that came out a couple of years ago, the title of which is... Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. And that book is available anywhere books are sold. And if you want to hear me doing the narration of an audiobook, you can get that from the Amazon site. It's on Audible, which I guess Amazon snapped up some mm -hmm. time ago. Uh, and that has proven to be one of the more popular formats. Mm -hmm. It's also available, of course, on paper and also for Kindle. So we hope you will do that. Um, well, while we're on the subject of books, mm -hmm. and we said the title of this of today's uh, podcast is It's Still Not About Communication. Mm -hmm. let, let me give a little... Um, well, actually, uh, Judy, you said you, you had a great idea for how we should do today's podcast, right? Right, right. So I'm going to interview a little bit because we're going to be talking about Bruce's upcoming book called It's Not About Communication. So uh, I will be interviewing Bruce a little bit about it. And um, Bruce, why don't you start off by telling us why you wrote this book? Great question. What a wonder. You, you asked all the great questions. I, I do want to <laughs> throw in, aside from the title, It's Not About Communication, the subtitle is Why Everything You Know About Couples Therapy is Wrong. Yes. So why did you decide to write this book? Yes. I, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, there is an interesting phenomenon we've referred to uh, several times when we've talked about this on our podcast. We've had this, what are we, in the 80s somewhere, this is like mm -hmm. number 87 or 88 or something like that, uh, of our podcast. We've done been doing this for several years now. And by far, I mean, it isn't even close. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like by, by 40 or 50 percent more, yeah. the most popular podcast is the one called it's not about communication. Mm -hmm. Well, that got my, both of our attention. We've right. talked about that. Right. It certainly got my attention. And I realized there is something about that concept that people find interesting. Now, I, I recognize the reason why people would go for that one is what they're thinking is it's about communication. Right. That's what every couple says. Oh, we just don't communicate. Right? Exactly. And, and I, yeah. I kind of did a seat of the pants guess, you know, uh -huh. like what proportion of the couples that come in in the first session uh, are saying in when they're when they're first answering my, my favorite opening question, which is how will you know if this is helping? Um, they're almost always the word, not almost always, I, two thirds of the time, rough guess, the word communication or communicate <laughs> appears in their answer. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, well, we need to communicate better. 
uh, we're having trouble communicating. We try to communicate and it doesn't work. We're just having difficulty with communication. You know, all of those th themes. And I realized along the way that rarely is it really about communication. Now, we'll get we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, later. I do want to put in a plug for our episode on that, which was goes back. It was somewhere in the 30s, like number 36 or 37, I think. Mm -hmm. So it goes back a ways. Uh, check out that episode. It's still a good episode. <laughs> it still works. <laughs> and it's still relevant. And it's still relevant. Uh, but... I realized uh, after working with folks, you know, as I developed a lot of the ideas that I wrote about in the earlier book, Reigniting the Spark, I realized that it's rarely about communication. It's actually, when people say what they need is tools for communicating, that's mm -hmm. what they're saying. Can you teach us how to communicate better right. so that we will not run into these problems? Mm -hmm. And what I discovered, and, and if you go online and look for, you know, communication rules or, you know, ways of improving communication, you will find bazillions of sites that talk about how can you communicate better. And what I realized was, and the the teaching people rules about that, which is, you know, my, my, my snarky subtitle, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot of what people think they know about couples therapy is it's about teaching people how to communicate better. Yeah. And you can find, as I say, bazillions of websites and many, many of my fellow therapists who will be happy to teach you lots of procedures and rules to active listen, to, uh, you know, nonviolent communication is one. I don't mean to be dismissive of these things, but if what you think you get in couples therapy is how to communicate, you know, the rules for how to communicate, it turns out that is not going to help you. Yeah. And that's why I wrote this book because I thought, first of all, look, I wrote it because I thought people might be interested in it. You know, mm -hmm. I thought people might want to buy this book because it's, you know, it's a it's a um, rather contrarian view that I am uh, <laughs> expressing strongly. And I think if, if I don't, <laughs> if you don't mind my blowing my own horn a little bit, um, in a rather engaging way, I believe. Of course, mm -hmm. you, you've read the book. Uh, <laughs> it's rather engaging. Yes, yes it and, is. I know yes, you're a totally non unbiased uh, Totally observer. unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to say, folks, one of the reasons it's engaging as it is is because Judy read it and gave me all kinds of suggestions, which I then incorporated in revision. So that's why it's as engaging as it is. She yeah, helped a lot see, with there, that. See, there you go. A good, good reason to listen to your wife. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always a good plan, folks. Um, but... So that's that's one of the the reasons I wrote about it, and you know it, it is a um, it's fascinating because one of the things I point out in the book is that well it's almost not you know, not about communication you know it's it's almost never about communication yeah. occasionally it is but those are circumstances that really aren't about couples therapy occasionally I have met folks you know I've met thousands of people over the years occasionally I've met folks where oh, you actually have a communication problem. That would be, for example, if one or both of the of the couple are somewhere on the autistic spectrum. Right. You know, like high-functioning autism, mm -hmm. that, that's not, not that unusual. And one of the things that happens with autism is someone doesn't know how to read the other person's mind, do you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we will, you, you know what I mean by reading mind. We, we can't literally read each other's minds, but you, you can kind of pick up. On oh, the you, cues, the ex social cues, the visual cues, the facial things, exactly. body it's language. Like, oh, you seem yeah. upset or you seem happy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if someone is not able to do that, is, which is one of the characteristics of autism, then indeed they will have communication problems and that the solution for that is for people who are in, who are neuroatypical in that way to do some skills training and that's often very helpful. Yeah. That really isn't couples therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, can be useful. And I don't mean to say that that sort of training has no place with them both in the room. You know? No, I know. You're not being dismissive, but this is not really geared to neuroatypical couples. No, exactly. And, and, and even if they are neuroatypical, again, it, that sort of procedure to learn those skills, that's not what I'm calling couples therapy. It's like, mm -hmm. well, no, you do need to learn those skills. So there's that. There's, there's something as very common as hearing loss Hearing loss causes actual communication problems that can actually show up in couples therapy. But what we're working on in couples therapy, of course, isn't about how do you address the hearing loss per se. It's working about how do you address the emotional ramifications of that. Right. So that comes up. I, I will admit that comes mm -hmm. up. That's communication issues. Um, other situations, you know, other kinds of uh, like brain injuries or cognitive impairment, you know, dementia, that mm -hmm. sort of thing that can cause communication mm -hmm. issues. The vast, vast majority of people who show up in my office saying they want communications help yeah. aren't in those categories. Right. Right. The vast majority of what they're saying, and, and this is my, here's my little catchphrase, folks. 
people think that they need to communicate, they need to learn how to communicate. And what I point out is, no, no, learning how to communicate will not help you. You already know how to communicate. You're already very effective at conveying the disrespect you feel for your partner mm -hmm. or the respect you feel for your partner. Mm -hmm. You're already very effective at conveying whether you're angry or whether you're resentful or whether you're happy or whether you're loving. All of those things you're really already quite effectively communicating. The problem isn't how you're communicating. The problem is what you're communicating and how you communicate is going to follow from what you're communicating. Uh -huh. And so that's what I wrote about in the book. And one of my uh, favorite pieces of that, and we've mentioned that in fairly recent episodes of our podcast, uh, that example, and I use this example in the book, I, uh, what do I call them in the book? The, the uh, characters are Cal and Polly, which I realized after I made up were like <laughs> Cal Polly, which sounds as a, like a- Like a know, college. Like a, like a university, <laughs> right, exactly. But anyway, the point being those two, you yeah. know, the people. And this was based on, on a real experience, sure. obviously fictionalized. And what happened one day was they, they came into the office and Cal had realized basically, and it was actually after he listened to one of our podcasts, as a matter of fact, the, it was the one about, it's not about communication. Mm -hmm. And he realized, oh my God, apparently I do think she's a moron. Mm -hmm. We did a podcast about this. Right. And and she was smiling because she was saying, you know, first of all, understanding he's finally understanding the problem wasn't how he was couching his disrespect. The problem right. was the disrespect. Mm -hmm. And she was smiling also because she, you know, because she could have been really angry about this. But she was saying, yeah, and you know what? The trouble was I agreed with him. I thought I was a moron, <laughs> right. too. Neither one of them, of course, <laughs> are morons or thought they were or really thought they were morons. But that was what was coming through. Mm -hmm. He was really genuinely being disrespectful. And it, to his great credit. He figured that out. He opened himself up to realize that and said, oh, I, I do seem to think I know better than she does about everything. And of course, I don't. So let me ask you this question. When you say why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong, what what exactly do you mean by that? Well, so I... It's, like what assumptions do people make about couples therapy and why do you say it's wrong? Funny you should mention that because, and, and uh, listeners, you don't know this, but what I'm doing right now as we speak is I'm pulling up an outline of the book, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And that question you just asked, almost as if you were familiar with the book, it's amazing how you did that. You know, folks, we don't, um, we don't plan these uh, podcasts in advance, but you know, we don't practice. We don't practice. But Judy was apparently primed to ask that incredibly relevant question. Chapter six uh -huh. of the book uh -huh. is entitled Busting Myths About Couples Therapy. Okay. So that concept that, yeah, everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. There's a number of different myths that that I consider. That's really what that, that mm -hmm. statement is about. Look, I know it's an overblown statement, right? It's a one of those hyperbolic statements, but there's some truth in it. So the first one we already talked about, the idea that uh, that couples therapy should be about how to communicate. Uh -huh. No, it shouldn't, actually. It needs to be about what you're communicating, and that's a whole different set of issues. Read the book if you want more depth on that. Uh, the second, uh, second myth that I bust in there is that Couples therapy is a treatment for mental illness. It's a, it's a mental health uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. And that turns out to be inaccurate as well, uh, because if you try and do it that way, and folks do try and do it that way, you, you end up basically distorting the whole process. You, you know, in order to, to decide it's a treatment for mental illness, you have to assign somebody a mental health diagnosis, mm -hmm. which is an individual diagnosis. Again, read the book about that, but that's another myth. Uh, another myth. And sometimes people will point this out, and like all of these myths, there's a germ of truth in it, but it's not the whole story. The idea that couples therapy provides a neutral third party. It's yeah. like, it's a good thing to have a neutral third party. Well, of course, I don't take sides with either person. But the reason I say that's that's something of a myth is, it's not that I don't take sides. It's that there aren't sides, which is a very different thing. Mediation is about a neutral third party. Mediation is when there are sides, they are negotiating, mm -hmm. they have different interests, they are in conflict, and this neutral third party's job is to help them arrive at a satisfactory agreement. Totally honorable, important thing to do. If you think couples therapy is mediation, you're, it's not going to work well for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk about that in the book. Again, you can see why there's more about that. Another myth, uh, when, and this is one of my favorites, your couples therapy will give you good advice. 
Couples therapist. Your couples therapist, uh -huh. right. And therefore your couples therapist. Yes, your right. couples therapist will give you good advice. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, I have to say earlier on in my career, I was, I was way more uh, precious about this than I have come to be later on as I've gotten older. Uh -huh. But the idea of your therapist giving you advice turns out to be a really bad idea in most cases. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. You get advice from all kinds of people. Advice, you know, and it's funny, just this morning, you know this, Judy, just this morning I, I had a routine dentist appointment. Right. And, you know, had a cleaning and the dentist came and checked and lo and behold, you know, she advised that I need, she gave me advice, right? She advised that I need a filling replaced and mm -hmm. she showed me on the x-ray why. She advised that I should stop using, you know, alcohol-based mouthwash mm -hmm. for various reasons. Mm -hmm. She advised that I should start using a water pick as opposed to just, you know, the flossing I've been doing and stuff. You know, she gave me advice. Yeah. I'm glad she did. She's an expert. She knows way more about dentistry than I do. That's right. why I go to her and not, you know, and I do well to take that advice, mm -hmm. right? So that's the kind of professional that is giving you advice. When I go to a physical therapist, they say, do these exercises that will help you. That's advice. When you go to a couples therapist, if I were to give people advice about how to live their life, I think that is horrendously, first of all, it's presumptuous because I am not an expert in living anybody else's life. Now, I don't shun the notion of expertise. I mm -hmm. do have expertise that I have taken many years to develop. The expertise I have is in having conversations with people that help them figure out how to live their lives. So what about all those people who say, well, my therapist told me this. My therapist said I should do that. My right. therapist, you know, says this and they and their therapists are giving them advice. So you don't you don't do that or you don't think that's a good idea. If, if I do that, I, I, I don't like to do that. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. I do it in rare circumstances. There have been rare circumstances where I will. But even then, I dress it all up by saying, look, it's not for me to tell you what to do. And I really mean that, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And I, oh, I hear that one. Oh, I hear that one where each of the parties, you know, the couple is right. saying, well, my therapist said this and my therapist said that. And, <laughs> exactly. And look, I, I don't mean to be in any way disrespectful of my colleagues in the field. I am simply noting that what your therapist tells you is relatively irrelevant with respect to what's going on in couples therapy. It matters what you think, not what your therapist thinks. Mm -hmm. Indeed, you may have concluded some things based on conversations with your therapist. That's a very useful thing. I, couples decide all kinds of things after conversations with me. Mm -hmm. But it's I'm not giving them advice as to what to do. I am exploring with them what their options are. Mm -hmm. And they're figuring out, they're making the choices. And I'm not just being, I think, I'm not just being cute here. You know, I'm not just covering my rear end by saying sure. this. I mean it in a very deep way. I don't claim to know better than you do how to live your life. Mm -hmm. And if I thought I did, and look, I have to say, folks, I have had many conversations with therapists over the years where they think they do. I, it's funny. I remember one from, oh, this must be 25 years ago. I remember meeting with a, a, a colleague and just in a uh, consultation group, you know, it was a bunch mm -hmm. of colleagues talking about their, our work, which is a really valuable thing to do, you know. Sure. So, and I remember that very issue coming up and saying, you know, we, we I, I offered that opinion, you know, we don't know better than people how to live their lives. Uh -huh. And this particular guy said, what if we do? <laughs> a and, little arrogant, isn't well, it? Well, <laughs> yeah. And look, I know what he was thinking about. Yeah. He was thinking about working with folks whose lives from an external perspective, are just a complete mess. You yeah. know, there, there are all kinds of horrible things going on. And, you know, we know better than that, you know. Mm -hmm. No, we don't, because we're not in their circumstance. And so the idea of giving advice, as I say, and again, <laughs> folks, read the book. The idea of giving advice is not what you need from your couples therapist. What you need from your couples therapist is skillful conversations, you know, helping you figure out what you ought to do. Yeah. And if your couples, and, and again, you know, I could say that, but really mean, but I really do know better. And I really don't mean that. And that turns out to be important. So, no, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go I ahead. was just going to go on to the next. Minute. Well, I was going to ask you, yeah. how, how do you measure success in couples therapy? Funny you should mention. Should let me ask the questions. <laughs> if <laughs> you, I'm interviewing you. You teed that one up. For, well, yeah, I thought I was just kind of going through the list. No, no, yes, no you don't have to go through a question. list. I'm no. asking you go questions. For go for it. How do you measure success <laughs> in couples therapy? Well, it turns out. If you measure success in couples therapy by whether or not the couple stays together, mm -hmm. I 
humbly offer that that is complete and utter nonsense. The percentage of couples that stay together isn't a measure of anything terribly useful. And you will see that on therapist websites, folks. You will see, oh, we have an 80% or 90% success rate, meaning that 80 or 90% of the couples who come to see us end up staying together, you know? Mm -hmm. That is, that basically tells you virtually nothing. And I'll tell you why that's true. First of all, sometimes when they say that, it's because they're really selective about who they will accept. And they will be careful, you know, they won't count people that they have an interview with and say, oh, no, I don't think I can work with you. I don't think I can help you. So they exclude them. So they're basically narrowing it down to people that have said there's no way on earth we're going to split up, which, by the way, even that isn't completely reliable. But, you know, there's ways of inflating that. Let's put it that way. Moreover, I've had lots of of uh, couples I work with where the successful outcome as as they determined it. And it's, you know, it's important. I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. Mm -hmm. The successful outcome was that they split up. Yeah. And, and look, I have a bias, and I often mention this to folks. I have a, you know, I have a gut level bias. It's like, oh, I, I, I'm happy when couples stay together. Just yesterday, I was talking with a couple that when I first started working with them had separated and they were trying to talk about, you know, how to deal with their child. Mm -hmm. And they realized after the first session, they started getting together again. They wanted to come back together. And yesterday they showed up smiling and they he moved back in home. And oh. it was, and look, that makes my heart sing. That's just sure. delightful. But that's not my, that's not for me to determine. And the other complication about how do you measure success rate? There's three people at least involved in that determination. There's the two members of the couple, and then there's a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I am I can think of lots of circumstances over the years where the three people involved in that determination had three different opinions. Sure. And when that happens, typically what happens is if one one of the couple thinks, well, this is really helpful, and the other couple thinks it really wasn't, usually that's because the one who thinks it's helpful was the one who said, yeah, unfortunately, we need to split up, and the other person isn't happy about that. That's a sad outcome. So what do I think about the success or failure? I think they're both right. I think, yep, from one point of view, this was a success. And from another point of view, it was a failure. And I give an example in the book of another couple I worked with years ago where they thought it was successful. And I'm sitting there thinking, I, I don't see how this helped them at all. Uh -huh. Again, not for me to make the determination, but right. they both were happy with what we had done. And I'm thinking, I don't see how that helped, but I'll take your word for it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting. It isn't so simple in couples therapy to determine success. And, you know, in individual therapy, there's all kinds of work about, you know, get the get your client to define their goals and then see to what extent they've reached their goals. And of course, you can reevaluate that. That, that all makes sense in individual therapy. In couples therapy, it's just way too complex for that. Mm -hmm. Now, the funny thing about that is, and I go into this in another part of the book, just because it's hard to do, just because it isn't simply defined, you know, there's multiple variables determining whether it's a success or not. It could be a success in some ways and a failure in other ways. Just because that's true doesn't mean you shouldn't evaluate it. Mm -hmm. In fact, on the contrary, you have to evaluate, is it helping all the time. And that I already mentioned, that's my favorite opening question. Yeah. How do you, you know, how will you know if this is helping? Right from the get go, I'm saying, you know, have your finger on the pulse of whether this is doing you any good or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an important issue, but you can't necessarily uh, measure success, you know, uh, in a simple way. Sure. Yeah. Now, I know that, you know, our our seven word formula, be kind, don't panic and have faith. Mm -hmm. One of the topics that you talk about in your in this upcoming book is uh, find a therapist who embodies faith. Yes. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that and what that means and how it manifests itself? Yeah, I'd be happy to. That's a tough one, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I, I do point that out in the book. It's, you can't look up, oh, which therapists embody faith or not. I will say the the expression faith-based therapist mm -hmm. has virtually nothing to do with what I'm talking about. In sometimes, actually, I, I say this with a bit of pain in my voice and my in my heart. Sometimes faith-based therapist means not only isn't the same. It's sometimes it's the exact opposite of mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Because sometimes faith-based th faith-based therapist means fundamentalist, right? And they already have the answers. And that's the exact opposite of what I mean by faith. 
So you're not talking about um, like when people go see the pastor. It's not that faith. That it isn't that faith. faith, though I will say I know plenty of people who have gone to their pastor and uh -huh. received wonderful help yeah. that I would call faith in the terms that I'm describing it. So how, how how can you describe faith where it's not a religious faith? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it might be, but it doesn't have to be. Right. So what? Yes. What do I mean by that? When I talk about faith, and this was true in the earlier book as well, and I also have a lot about it in this book as well. When I talk about faith, I mean a general idea that it's a mindset. I talk about that in this book. It's a mindset that says reality is right to be what it is. And when you approach life through that frame, reality is right to be what it is, even when it's painful, even when it's hard to understand. We're not going to always understand why things are the way they are. We haven't got a God's eye view of the universe. You know, we have our we're, we have our human limitations, you know, but that mindset that says, yeah, but there's a rightness about it, how that manifests in terms of a therapist. Well, you know how we were talking about giving advice yeah. and the therapist has said, well, I do know better, mm -hmm. you know. That's the opposite of what I mean by faith. Mm -hmm. If I if I went around thinking, oh, I see your problem. I know better than you. Do mm -hmm. this and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. That would be basically saying, apparently, you're too stupid to know how to live your life. And that's the opposite of faith. Faith would say, okay, you're in a difficult situation. You may have been making decisions that you now regret. You know, classic example of that is infidelity, right? A couple come in. That's a large pr proportion of the couples I see. Uh -huh. There's infidelity and they come in and... The person who did the cheating is usually feeling very guilty and terrible about it. If they're in therapy about it, they're they're owning up to it. And the person who's cheated on is hurt and angry and all of those things. A faith approach says, okay, this is really painful, but because reality's right to be what it is, there's some validity in what you did, even though it was morally wrong, even though you shouldn't have done it and you regret it, all true. But we can't just dismiss it. We mm -hmm. can't just say, well, then the answer to this is very simple. Go and sin no more. If you do that, you are, you're basically saying to someone, well, apparently you were crazy or evil when you did that. And so the solution is don't be crazy or evil. But a faith-based approach would say, no, you're almost certainly not crazy or evil. And if you're not crazy or evil, there had to have been some meaning there that we better explore, even though it's painful to explore mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's what I mean by faith. It's the opposite of, you know, what what you see in a therapist who's embodying faith the way I describe it is, you know, we all have our favorite techniques. We all have our favorite concepts and ways of thinking of things, but we're not stuck there. Mm -hmm. It's not an ideology. It's it's ideas, but it's not, a, you know, we don't get, we don't impose on you. We don't fit you into our algorithm as if you're a piece of data. Yeah. So how do you find a therapist that embodies that faith? That's a great question. Damned if I know. <laughs> I mean, frankly, you know, and, and uh, I'll tell you what I mean by that. And I do address that in the book. There's no, there isn't a simple way to do that. You know, you, how do you find a therapist at all? You find a therapist by getting recommendations from friends or other professionals, or you find them on a website or you uh -huh. know, a listing or something. The issue isn't how you find the therapist. The issue is how do you decide if it's working? How do you decide if it's helping? And that turns out to be a lot about whether what you're experiencing is faith. Yeah. Because faith is what helps. Uh -huh. That's what I mean. So the, the great question, how do you find a therapist who embodies faith? Well, you find a therapist and then as you're experiencing it, if it's going well, if it's helping... I realize this borders on circular reasoning, but if it's helping, apparently they're embodying faith, you know. And and how do you know when to pull the plug on your therapist? Great, great question. That is so similar. It's funny. I I, I, uh, I didn't have a uh, section about this in the book. Maybe I should add one. But, <laughs> Maybe. You know, remember this, the uh, chapter in Reigniting the Spark? How do you know when to call it quits? Yeah. In a relationship. In a relationship, It is right. pretty much identical. Uh-huh. To that, you know, how do you know? Because it is a relationship with a therapist. How do you know whether when to pull the plug? You know, uh, the, what I say about relationships in general is, well, you divide things into either it's either growing pains or it's deal breakers. Mm -hmm. And if what you're getting is a deal breaker, you'd break the deal. Now, what would be a deal breaker from a therapist if your sense is that they are just flat out not not uh, respectful of you? You know, <coughs> if your sense mm -hmm. is that they seem to just be completely cynical or distracted or, you know, if you just get a bad or, vibe. Or telling you what to do all the time. Or telling you what to do all the time. And look, even then, 
Should I should I give away the zinger of the book? Is it should I should I put in a spoiler about the book? It doesn't occur until I guess I will. Here you are, folks. I don't think this will stop you from reading the book. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> but now I'm gonna I'm gonna risk it. There's so many good things. There's there. there's a lot of good yeah. things. But I will tell you the spoiler because it relates to what I was just talking about. You know how I say why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. I introduced the last chapter by saying, "Here's the zinger, folks." It's not just you. Mm -hmm. Everything I know about couples therapy is wrong, too. Ah. Ah. And it relates to what we were just talking about, because you know how I've just been spouting off about this whole business mm -hmm. of don't give advice and, right? you know, and don't tell people what to do. Yeah, except sometimes that's helpful. I don't do that. But you might find yourself with a therapist whose style is the opposite of everything I'm saying uh -huh. and discover, you know, a Chalmer wouldn't understand this, but this person's really helping us, <laughs> you know, and that's really, truly possible. So how do you know if they're embodying faith and how do you know when to pull the plug? You know, there aren't simple rules for that any more than there are simple rules for deciding in any given moment, is it successful or not? You have it's a narrative. It's not a it's not a, a Likert scale for those of you who are old, you know, nerds like I am. Uh, it's not a one to five scale. You uh -huh. know what I mean? It's not like, oh, check off what number it is. Right. It's a complex narrative. It's like, well, maybe it's helping and maybe it isn't. And you have to decide that with your gut in consultation with your partner. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've just not infrequently. I will have folks come in for the first session and they will tell me. Yeah, we saw somebody else. I, this just happened a couple of weeks ago. I met a couple for the first time, and they said, we saw somebody else, and within 10 minutes, we ended the session. We knew it just wasn't working because one or the other was just feeling insulted by the person. They wow. were. It felt like um, they were already, you know. So this uh, is before they came to you. This is before they came to me. So it's right. not like they saw you went to somebody else and then came back. No, no, no. This is before they came to me. Uh -huh. No, they were just describing a previous experience they uh -huh. had had. You know, I always like to hear about that because, <laughs> among other things, I don't want to replicate that. You know? Right. So it's it's so interesting that that issue of how do you know when to call it quits or same thing. How do you know if it's working? Uh huh. It turns out it isn't simple, but you have to do it anyway. So it's. And it's, I guess it's also like a gut thing. If you just feel like this person isn't going to help me, or the questions they're asking are ludicrous, or it just has they don't have no understanding of what's going on in yeah, my life. Yeah then the, those would be the indications. And I am always, you know, one of my big ethical things that I do right from the get-go is m I try and make it clear in everything I do to people that they are the ones who get to decide, do we come back again? You know, do mm -hmm. they want to come back again? Mm -hmm. That, you know, I don't routinely ask, when do you want to come back? Right, so I you routinely... don't have like, oh, you're going to be my Monday 3 o'clock. Exactly, I don't do that. Yeah. And moreover, I don't even say, when do you want to come back? Uh -huh. I, even if I had a standing appointment. Uh -huh. I don't say, see you next week. Right. I say, would you like to come back next week? Mm -hmm. I, I always ask that as a questioner, almost always, mm -hmm. because I want to be very clear about that. Anybody has the, not only the right, but the responsibility to decide, do you think it's helping or not? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's an important part of, it. you know, it's it's a corollary to the idea that I don't get advice. It's like, no, you got to figure this out. you got to live your life. Mm -hmm. And the faith part says you got to live your life and you're the right person to be living your life. Sure. You have that yeah. ability to do that. So that that's the stuff I talk about. Well, I hope that uh, this discussion has whetted your appetites um, for the book. It's not about communication, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong, which is not yet out, and it probably won't be for a few months. Uh, but we wanted to give you a little taste of what's uh, coming up in Bruce's new book. Yeah. Plus, uh, to watch out for our new website, ctn7.com. And I uh, just wanted to say, if you have any questions that you would like us to address on this podcast, you can write to Bruce, Bruce at ctn7.com, or to me, Judy at ctn7.com, or just visit our soon-to-be-updated website, ctn7.com. It's still functioning now as it is, so it, you can still go there. You can still go there, and even now, uh, and our, our old, ugly website, as opposed to our new, beautiful one that will mm -hmm. be, 
Uh, you can go to our old ugly website. See this? I'm hoping this will pique people's curiosity to go check out our old <laughs> ugly website. It's pretty bad, folks. It's funny. I didn't think it's it was nearly as bad. bad. Well, I I didn't think that. It's only bad when comparison, in comparison to how it's going to look. But now. then I saw the I saw the her ideas. You know, for the new ones, like oh, that looks really nice. So anyway, yeah. the point and we, being, uh, yeah, we have and we've got a lot of uh, good interviews coming up. We do. In I the just next I just want to say about the website. Oh, so I'm sorry. When when you go to the old website, mm-hmm. uh, uh-huh. you can actually sign up for a time to be interviewed yourself and that's what you were about to say about our right. upcoming interviews upcoming interviews if you'd like to be interviewed so uh you can still sign up for that or have suggestions for topics or folks that you would like us to interview you can let us know that as well and so um we also want to put in a, yet another plug for you to share information about this podcast. Let people know about it. Our uh, reader, uh, reader uh, li- not readership, listenership uh, keeps growing. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little um, a little listener poll out there. Oh, yeah. Good yes. idea. I was thinking about that, too. Exactly. You want to you want to mention that? Well, yeah, we we started out as an audio only podcast. Then we went to video podcast. And uh, after some discussions with uh, I won't say who. We decided to go back to an audio podcast, and now we've been getting feedback that we should be video. So <laughs> <laughs> we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. Let yes. us know. Either drop us a line, or uh, you can. You know what? On on um, the Facebook page. On the Facebook page is an ideal place to do it. Couples Therapy in Seven Words uh, Facebook page. If you go to our Facebook page, uh, put a comment in there, and we'll put up a post that asks for that. Maybe we can even put up a poll. Right? Well, you we can, can do, do that. that. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can put up a poll. We want to know, would you prefer the, the we do this in video or audio only? And, of course, I do realize the video ones can also be listened to. Sure. You know what I mean? And we were always pretty careful when we would do it to not assume that people could see what's on the screen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we could we could do it uh, that way. So, yeah, let us know uh, which way you would prefer. And please, uh, you know, if you enjoyed our, our discussion about the upcoming book, let me tell you, if you thought any of that was interesting, you will find the book that's already out there, Reigniting the Spark, interesting as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has um, other ideas that we don't go into uh, at all in the new book, and, and vice versa, by the way. the new If you've read the old book, you'll find the new book, I think, quite stimulating as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do check that out, Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy, and How to Get It Back, available anywhere books are sold. Mm-hmm. And so until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm-hmm.